So today on our timber frame mailbox, we're going to start our mortise and tenon work. Oh man, this is what we've all been waiting for. This is the, this is my favorite part. All right, so we're going to cut a mortise. A mortise is the as you all very well may know, is the female portion of the joint that the cross beam is going to fit into. And so what I've decided, it's all about looks and aesthetics, you know, and you try to do things in proportion to the timber sizes and there is no, uh, there's no plans. There was some question in the comments about that, that some of, uh, some of you would like to see some plans uh, of what I'm building before I build it, but I don't, I don't work off any plans and that's not necessarily a good thing, it's just, I don't have any plans. I just have a picture in my head of kind of what I'd like it to look like. And even that picture kind of is amended at the end of the day. A couple comments on, also on, I was reading through the comments this morning on calloused hands. What happened to my calloused hands? My hands are calloused. I, I uh, use them, uh, I don't wear gloves as much as I used to. Um, I don't know, they're going proof, proof's in the pudding there, I guess. So my a subscriber Arfwind asked a question about full dimension timbers and what I was referring to by that. Full dimension timbers are, are, or lumber is material that actually is what it says it is. If, it, if I say full dimension six by six like this, that it measures a true six inches by six inches. Now the stuff that you're gonna buy at, at your lumber yards is gonna be typical framing material like this. This is a piece of what they would call a two, piece of a two by six. And it's not actually two by six. If you measure it, you'll see that it's inch and a half by five and a half. The reason why it's that, that size is the, the original two by six, the rough cut before it was planed down to be and then shipped out was that thick. It started out as a two by six, but with bows and imperfections and all that, by the time they mill it all out and joint it and everything, they bring it down to a, uh, what it is now, one and, one and a half by by a three and a half, or four and a half, five and a half, excuse me. So in this area, in many places in the country, that you will, uh, if you want to use your own material, because uh, lumber needs to be, it's gotta be rated and certified by, I don't know, government agencies or something. You can't just uh, cut your own lumber and sell it. It's gotta be approved by a forester or somebody who knows, make sure it's structurally good, that's gonna be decent. You know, with all of those things, I don't know that it's so much these rules are in effect for public safety, but just to monopolize and make it difficult for small time guys or small sawmills, as is so much the case with many of these regulations, very little to do with public safety. But it, check with your local areas, but if you do want to cut your own timbers and your own lumber, if you cut it full dimension, if you cut your two by fours full two by full four, they'll typically, that extra wood, they'll, they'll, they'll let you get by that. You can use your own. Not that I would ask their permission anyway, but if you're that type of per person, uh, you could go that route. How about that? You guys got me going political on you here. Try to avoid all of that. All right, so we're gonna transfer our marks. This is critical, critical, critical that you get these right on. Even the way that you hold your, the angle of your pencil can make a difference in how thick the lead is. What's a better way to go is to use a knife blade. So once I've transferred that mark on there, I can just put my knife right in there, take the ruler to it, combination square, whatever, go down here. And also you don't mark up the wood in ways that you need to get rid of the, the marks or sand them down. I just put a little cut right there and I'm good. And I can do the same thing over here. This is a very exciting day. This is the first time uh, that I've ever got to use my beautiful beam drill. I mean, I've used it just playing around, but I've never actually used it to, to bore a hole. And man, I'm ex <laughs> excited. So we'll, uh, let, let, I'll show you how, we'll, we'll set this up together. Um, I'm, we'll we'll kind of just uh, figure it out here by doing it. So this is one of my, one of my prized possessions, my great treasures. So the first thing we want to do is, uh, it seems to me, is to square it. And I can kind of eyeball that, make sure that we're drilling perpendicular. 
Yeah, it looks pretty good. We'll tighten these wing nuts down here. Oh, this is neat. Now, if you don't have a beam drill, don't worry. You can do the, you can do the same thing, actually. Do it probably faster with an electric drill. But uh, having this, I just can't resist, you know. Oh man, that's neat. So let's talk about bits a little bit here. I'll show you the bit I'm using and, and uh, just a real quick tutorial on, on how to keep them sharp and, and running really good. Now here's the mortise that we're gonna cut out. So you can cut these out with a chisel. You, I, I've done that, I did that for, for years, a long time, but you can go a lot faster if you can take a lot of this material out with a good auger bit. So what I've done is, is I've, the CL right there stands for the center line. I've marked out that center line exactly where the center, center of the mortise is. Now, Yes, you might say you could use a two inch bit because it's a two inch mortise, but what typically happens is, is it wanders a bit and you get off to the side and, and you end up getting encroaching or even exceeding your lines on the outside. And if those are show, if you're doing showing, if you're doing really fine work, that's just not something you want. So what I've typically done and what's worked is I'll size it down. So I'll just use an inch and a half. That way, if I make a mistake either side of the line, it, it's, not, it's not a big deal. So this particular bit, this is a really nice bit. This is a vintage bit, uh, Milwaukee. I got two of these off of eBay years ago in, in the original packaging in the boxes. And they really leave a nice finish because uh, it's hard to find bits like this. The old ones, like the Ur ones you've seen me use there, they've got a cutter on the side right there. So not only do they cut here, this is where the, the heavy lifting is done. This is, you know, right here is where they're going to be cutting the wood. But if you don't have the cutters on the side, it, you'll get a lot of tear out. You don't get good clean holes. But what these do here on the side is they, is they pre-cut these little wings. As they, as they rotate around there, they pre-cut. They stick down further than the main, main cutters and it gives you a really nice clean hole. But you wanna keep these things tip top and running as good as you can. And that's what's nice about the old tools is you know, many times they're designed, to, they could be serviced. So maintaining and sharpening these, these old bits and things by yourself, uh, yourself is really simple. Just a small, a three-sided, or actually a six-sided, six-sided file, a jeweler's file. You can, it doesn't take very much, but you can just keep, keep those edges there nice and sharp. I cut, I sharpen those those little cutters there on the side. Now, don't sharpen it from the outside. If you sharpen it from the outside, you're gonna make your bit smaller and you want this to maintain its inch and a half width. So you sharpen from the inside, inside only, and have good light. It's important whenever you're sharpening something to have good light so you can see if your angle's correct. You can see where it's polishing, where it's cutting. It doesn't take very much, just a little bit. I've never sharpened this one, these before and I've used them a lot, and they, I can just see it's got just a little, few little burrs on them. I'm really careful with these bits not to run them into nails or anything. These are not the bits that I would use for doing my demo work and remodeling. I use cheaper, more disposable bits. These are fine word working bits there. But you can see there, you can, well, I can see, you can see, I can feel that that's nice and tight. Same thing here on these, on these cutting edges right here. I just to, just just run my file on there. Just knock off any any burrs. Keep that nice and sharp. I'll flip it over. Do the same thing here. Yeah. Looks good. I think that's gets ready to cut. This is a very special tool. This it's a. Uh, very rare. I mean, they're, they're out there. Very few of them in this type of condition that, that's still in what I consider to be usable condition. I mean, some people say this is a museum piece. There's lots of these in museums. But uh, I think the best, best use for these tools is it is important to, to keep them, you know, around in museums so people can see them and younger generations and how things were done. But more important than that, I think it's some equally important, let's say that, is to, is to keep using them and take care of them. And, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the road that I travel. There we go. So nice on these bits, nice to have uh, bits that have the uh, hexagon, octagon, never know those, flat sides. So these set screws work really good. 
and they don't spin on you. But I think, I, I think we're ready to go. So how this fabulous tool works is if you can see here, so if you lift, lift up on the levers, there's a catch here and you flip the cat catch and that releases it down on this uh, kind of a rack and pinion type of gear. And once the tool is down on the wood, you can flip this out of the way and now you're operating independent of that. And just the gravity and the weight and this corkscrew and the auger bit will pull it through. So the beam drill is, a, is do, for doing your heavy duty work. And so the reason why this, the carriage is set up the way it is, is it's, it's intended for the carpenter to sit on it. And just the weight of your body, look at this, it's even got leather on the bottom so it doesn't damage the, damage the material. So we'll lift this up, disengage the clasp, and then we can, very, in a very controlled manner, we can control that down, winding down that, that, that gear. And we'll just do the center hole here first. We'll do it right in the center and line that up right on our center line. You can see that's right. It's important to have that, that center line marked. So I've reached the end of the stroke here. Now we'll just flip the, the rack. I guess it's a rack, more of a rack and pinion type of gear. Bring that out, bring it all the way up and it parks there on its own. Let's take it, I'll slide this back. Let's take a look at the hole and see what, how well that, that bit, how clean of a hole that bit did made for us. You know, a lot of chainsaws going, looks like the neighbors are all Cutting their firewood, look at that, look at it. Look how crisp and clean the edges are. I mean, that, could you do better? Tell me, really, could you do better with any modern equipment? I, I, I say, well, just as good for sure, but certainly you can't expect much more than that. What a clean, nice hole that is, look at it. 